Telecast, the TV industry news review. Hi, I'm Justin Crosby, and welcome to this week's Telecast. Joining me on this week's show are Natalie Vogue, one of the international TV industry's leading entertainment format experts, and Broadcast Magazine's Insight Editor, Jesse Whittock. K7 Media's Gertz Lesis is back in the saddle and Deadline's TV editor Peter White brings us up to speed on the latest news from Hollywood. It's all coming up on this week's telecast. I'm delighted to welcome, direct from LA, content creator, developer, buyer, strategist and an executive known as one of the leading international entertainment format experts, Natalie Vogue. A former journalist at TF1, independent TV producer, head of development at Fremantle France, global VP of formats at IMG, and chief international officer at Endemore France, Natalie helped launch iconic formats that are still successfully airing today. Then running her own company, she has consulted for major players like ABC Studios, Fox, Canal Plus, and RTL, as well as independent producers. With Read Me Dem, she oversaw the MIP formats program, now number one event, in unscripted formats. In this highly disruptive industry, she's been spotting new trends and ideas on both TV and digital, and she has spoken at MIP TV and ATF for several years on the best ideas when TV formats meet digital. Natalie's also judge on prestigious competitions like the Emmy Awards and the Rose Door. And joining Natalie is Jesse Whittock, Insight Editor of Broadcast Magazine. Jesse oversees all long-form reporting, editing, and writing across the Broadcast Magazine and Broadcast Now website. He's been writing about television for more than 10 years. So, welcome to the show, Natalie and Jesse. Thanks, Justin. It's good to be here. Thanks, Justin. Uh, really nice uh, being here. Great. Natalie, coming to you first. Now, you're a familiar face in Cannes, and I bump into you at many industry events like Content London and, and lots of uh, events all around the world. You've moved to L.A. now. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, the idea uh, was uh, that I wanted to um, strengthen the, the bridge between uh, Europe and the U.S. I thought it made sense. Obviously, you know, I'm a, an expert in um, entertainment format, so the idea was really to focus on this Genre. I just decided to move uh, to be closer to the the, the American players, and uh, I'm not able to uh, to talk about my clients. I mean, I usually, you know, like to focus more on you know what I'm doing, and what I'm doing is basically uh, scouting. You know, I try to to spot the right formats for for them uh, to buy. I help them actually. I mean, generally speaking, develop their international uh, activity. So it means sometimes you know I work on. Uh, co-development deals, first look deals, etc. I'm also, you know, um, helping them develop uh, formats. So either starting with their development slates and uh, making them fit the um, the needs of the international market, and yes, and sometimes just uh, create from scratch. Just, I mean, if I had to summarize in a in a sentence, it would be just to help them uh, build up uh, their own catalog uh, for the international market. Beside, of course, all the you know, everything that, that they are doing uh, locally. Okay. And you say scouting formats. How does that work? Is that scouting domestically or internationally? And what does that look like? Are you looking at all the different new formats that are launching all over the world and seeing what might work for your clients? I love to try and, and spot the trends ahead. <laughs> Maybe it's, it, it comes from my, you know, my first job as a journalist. I always try to, to get the information first. So, and uh, I'm really passionate also about, uh, you know, formats in general. So I really try to understand the trends. Then, of course, you know, I adapt it to my client's needs. You know, if it's a channel, uh, obviously it's, it's a little bit different from a, from a producer. Although, I mean, basically everyone is looking for original ideas, ideas that can stand out. So obviously, you know, I always try to, to look for those original ideas. I think that uh, the positioning of uh, my clients and their DNA is also very, very important. So sometimes, you know, I can just, you know, start with, you know, something that could fit their DNA, even if it's not really super timely. I mean, it has to be timely, but, you know, what I mean is that sometimes the original ideas are in the back catalogs, uh, old ideas that you just have to modernize. 
repurposed for the modern day. Yeah. Unscripted formats seem to be coming out of the pandemic really, really quickly all around the world, back into production with, with all these different shows that have been real staples in, in the schedule and really, really important, particularly for commercial broadcasters. Are we seeing a, a new boom in entertainment and unscripted formats? Yeah, and actually it's uh, it started two or three years ago. And it, it's just because people just love content. I mean, of course, there's been a huge boom of scripted content, but they also love entertainment and, and unscripted. This boom came just before the pandemic. Maybe the pandemic just, just strengthened actually this boom just because unscripted is usually cheaper, more flexible. And, uh, and obviously, you can also find maybe uh, easier solutions when it comes to uh, production. When I'm talking about flexibility, it can also be like uh, the number of episodes. You can definitely, you know, do shorter seasons, uh, see how it works. And, and it definitely helps uh, the, this boom. There are definitely fresh ideas, really new and, and interesting ideas. I hadn't seen that happen for a while. So, I'm, I mean, in the long run, it definitely helped. And the last thing I wanted to maybe to add on the subject is that the two things that people are asking more and more are more interactivity and maybe gamification elements in the content. And that's definitely what entertainment formats are about, you know, more interactivity and and uh, yeah, and just again gamified elements. Uh, so, uh, so yes. Yeah, so I think it's uh, it's just the beginning. <laughs> we spoke to Jan Selling on a really early telecast a few months ago, and uh, and he was talking about formats. There's been many many MIPCOMs and MIP TVs recently. He's been looking for the next big global mega hit that's about to sweep everything before it, and it hasn't happened really and i suppose in in uh, the last year or two with the exception of the masked singer maybe it's certainly time that the unscripted formats industry had another real boost and there's some you know new fresh formats and maybe this pandemic has created the ground to stimulate the sort of creativity that's needed we are all looking for the next big thing that's for sure I think we shouldn't really focus on that, actually. It, it'll come when it, it'll come. And, and in the meantime, we should focus on, on smaller ideas. The streamers made uh, the viewers like spoiled kids, I would say. What they want is fresh content. What they want to talk about is, you know, what's next, what's new. They love to, to you know, to, to be, you know, the one telling uh, their friends and family, uh, the, you know, about, you know, the fresh new uh, program they saw on a, on one of those platforms. And so we should definitely focus on good ideas. Even if they're small, it's not a problem. Even if they just last one, two, three seasons, it's not a problem. There are so many new platforms around the world with new needs. I think we should only focus on good content, good idea, and then small ideas can become the, the next big thing. You know, you never know. <laughs> yeah, there are so many stories of strong format that started like uh, I mean, everyone st- st- thought they were really too small and they became hits so that's that's something really i'm convinced about we should not forget about the next big thing but just f- focus on original things and, and and just good content in general doesn't need to be a huge idea it's just a kernel of a really good idea if you see what the streamers like uh, for instance netflix uh, the latest brands we all talk about uh, are, you know, Marie Kondo or, you know, uh, Nailed It or if, I mean, obviously bigger uh, formats, but those brands are definitely famous, although they are not, you know, the, the next big thing. They are based on actually a genre uh, that's actually quite old. And it's still, you know, people love to watch it and they and they are famous and they're strong. And uh, it's just a definition also of what we consider the next big thing. Obviously, everyone wants a strong brand that lasts for many, many seasons. <laughs> but that's what professionals want. What viewers want is just uh, fresh content, original content. And if it lasts several seasons uh, because it's strong enough, that's fine. Otherwise, it's that's fine as, as well for them, you know, as long as they enjoy it. We shouldn't forget about that. We should definitely uh, jump on all opportunities, even if they seem a little bit smaller. It's not, it's not a problem. 
One thing I often struggle with is what makes a format a format, as opposed to just an unscripted entertainment show, for example. You know, when I've heard shows being pitched and it's like, oh, well, it could be a format. Or From your perspective, what's the definition of a TV format? To keep it really simple, for me, it's a content that's launched in a territory and then adapted in several territories thanks to uh, a production Bible with a, a few uh, format key uh, elements. MIPCOM is obviously coming up in six weeks' time. If it doesn't happen in physical form, I mean, we all hope that it will, but if it doesn't, how would you expect this to affect the formats business? I don't think it's uh, it's going to affect it that much uh, because we're all uh, actually preparing the event already on, on Zoom calls. Uh, we're all uh, exchanging information, etc. It's just going to be super frustrating because we won't be able to meet physically. I think we all need that. I mean, it's also uh, what this uh, industry is, uh, is made of, you know. Uh, but we all know that, you know, it's just temporary, so we'll deal with it. We just carry on regardless. Okay. Jesse, hello. Great to have you on Telecast. Finally, welcome to the show. It's it's been a long time coming, Justin. But worth the wait. We had broadcast editor Chris Curtis on the very first show back in April. We were talking about the the challenges for a print title as well as an online one, of which broadcast is. Can you tell us a bit about how broadcast has adapted to the pandemic? When you spoke to Chris on episode one of Telecast, we were just coming to terms with the impact of what the coronavirus would mean for things like print publishing and the news cycle and what sort of content we should be covering. And we were forced to pull our publication of our weekly print magazine the logistics around pulling together a weekly magazine were just were not possible. But what has happened subsequently is we really doubled down on our uh, online offering. So we're a subscription publication. The sort of UK TV production and broadcasting business are kind of our core subscribers. And so we really knuckled down on delivering them really top class news. Uh, we tried to give the freelancers as much information as we possibly could. In fact, we made our freelance section of our website free. And we then went back into talking about what we could do in terms of print. A while back, it was uh, related internally and, and it's now been uh, related externally that we're returning to print in September. What is different is we are moving to a monthly format which is, I think is pretty cool. My background is in sort of monthly magazines. I'm yeah, very excited by the opportunity. We're currently sort of getting into that stress-filled uh, period where we're about three weeks away from our first deadline. The magazine will be publishing late September on the, on the 24th. Um, that'll be going out to our subscribers, hopefully to home addresses and uh, to offices that have returned back. It's, you know, we're overhauling everything. Uh, we've got a new look masthead. We're supersizing the content. Needless to say, we have top quality interviews lined up. We're going to be focusing on things like diversity within British commissioning. We are looking at how indies responded to the COVID crisis. So uh, across uh, scripted and unscripted, what the British production community did uh, in terms of keeping their businesses going, in terms of winning new business, in terms of doubling down on development. We've got some really good talent interviews lined up. We're overhauling our, our rating section to focus more on sort of consolidated TV ratings, which we think uh, the readers have wanted for, for some time. And we've been working really hard to make sure that all works. So, yes, yeah, it's, uh, it's really exciting, but a lot of work. As you say, you had Chris on in, in April. He's been working his socks off to uh, redesign the magazine. And I've been working with him on the various regular formats and various other pieces that you'll see in that issue so you know touch wood we've got a really good product that the subscribers are going to really like and that uh, you know internationally people see at markets as and when they come back you know you'll talk about MIPCOM earlier on was making me feel slightly sentimental for those uh, fun days and even more fun evenings in Cannes so that's kind of where we are Justin it's been a sort of hectic weird unusual strange exciting few months I guess 
Well, it's, it's a fundamental change to your business model, isn't it? I mean, you're always pushing me for exclusives, Jesse. Can you give us any uh, exclusives on that content? You said talent interviews, because that's something different, isn't it? The broadcast is not really known for. We have been running more talent interviews online over the summer. We we got an exclusive with Michaela Cole. Uh, we spoke to Nish Kumar. I interviewed Ramesh Ranganathan a couple of months ago. That was a, a fun, uh, interesting piece to write. So what I can tell you is we have a really sort of top, top British talent being interviewed, a very famous, almost like national treasure like figure who is uh, is going to feature in that issue um so that should be worth looking out for and can you give us an idea about page count and you know what's going to be on the front is it always going to be talent led on the front because obviously we're used to broadcast magazine having the very latest news that's broken one or two d- days before print deadlines would allow with a monthly magazine it's presumably going to feel a bit more lifestyleish well, I suppose the best way to think of how broadcast is evolving is the place you'll go for your or for your news is online. We'll be breaking stories throughout the day, every day. We'll be delivering newsletters twice daily as we as we currently do. And the idea being that we'll, that will be the place you go for your absolutely up to date latest news stories breaking on international TV and British TV around the world. And the monthly magazine will be I mean, to an extent, more lifestyle driven in that we've got some some sort of, far, you know, interesting sort of fast moving pages in there. Um, there's more profile pieces, um, but that is much more a kind of thematic and uh, and long read style proposition. So we're, but the idea being that that will land on an indie's desk on the, uh, you know, towards the end of the month and they will be able to read that throughout the month and there's going to be packed full of content so that they will be able to dip in and out. They'll be able to refer back to things we've written. We can follow up online on things that pop. So, so the, the two propositions will be quite different, but I think they work quite harmoniously together. Some of the other... Publishing activity that broadcast is well known for are ones to watch, distributor surveys, indie surveys, and obviously your international issues around MIPCOM and and MIPTV. Will these all still exist in a different format? They're absolutely planned in. Uh, unfortunately, I, I can't get anything like that off of uh, my workload. <laughs> so um, no, you'll, you'll, you'll be seeing ones to watch, certainly the best places to work. The Indie Survey, which is probably our biggest and most important single piece of, of work we do every year, that's going to be there, absolutely. Uh, the Distributor Survey would normally launch in September, but for reasons that I won't go into, they are bitty and, and industry-specific things. Uh, we've decided to push that to December. There'll be a full report in, in, in December. And uh, yeah, so no changes there. Absolutely not. There's, uh, If anything, the way to look at this is we're sort of supersizing and supercharging what we're doing. There's, there's sort of no reduction on anything. So it's now it's time for us to look at your stories of the week. Natalie, yours was a Netflix story around Edinburgh that broke last week. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I read a few uh, articles on, you know, uh, what the uh, directors of Unscripted Originals and Acquisition (laughs) and Netflix uh, said uh, about their strategy on on unscripted formats. And obviously, that's super interesting. And, you know, the Chinese platforms uh, have been developing a lot of unscripted formats in the past few years were immediately uh, positioned in the uh, the format ecosystem. Uh, Netflix and Amazon, they've started also to develop many brands. The most famous uh, had been uh, Love Love is Blind, Floor is Lava, Too Hot to Handle, etc. Beside the content, what I thought was interesting is that they definitely are in the, the format ecosystem right now. They are definitely testing ideas in different territories. Uh, they testing, testing, testing. The two things that interested me are uh, first that they are uh, really looking for, you know, a new uh, big game show and also a new uh, talent singing show. But besides that, it's, it's the fact that they they always want something, you know, bigger and, and better than uh, than their competitor. That's, uh, that's you know, they, they put a lot of money on the table to do that. They also say, I mean, very often say that they, because they don't have um, a limited uh, shelf space, 
uh, they, they usually uh, play with uh, different release uh, patterns, whether batches or, you know, uh, all at once. They, they can basically do whatever they want. They said that they, they were not against uh, bringing a strong format and, and letting this strong format, uh, this strong brand stay f- for many, many years. But there would have to be a lot of changes season after season to keep it fresh, uh, because fresh is definitely their really big uh, worry, you know, how to keep, how to make people really happy with uh, new, fresh new content. So when you talk about, you know, uh, doing fresh uh, content season after season, you know, in terms of formats, uh, uh, it raises a few questions because usually when you talk about format, you talk about format key elements, you can slightly change uh, season after season. Usually it's still a format, so you have to uh, keep, you know, those uh, those key elements. So how do you make it fresh season after season? Does it mean that it can really drastically evolve? Would they be open to that? And then it would raise definitely a question for format owners. I thought it was super interesting because it brings a lot of energy again, uh, because they are out loud, you know, what they're looking for. But at the same time, uh, maybe, you know, it would be great to clarify what they think about when they are talking about making uh, content fresh season after season. Well, to hear Netflix talking about not only formats and game show formats and singing formats, but talking about having them on the service for 20 or 25 years is, is extraordinary. Do we expect to see a show, a global talent singing show that's going to take on the likes of X Factor or Got Talent that's going to play out right around the world on Netflix? Is that is that what we're, th- we're expecting? It's definitely uh, uh, what they are planning to do. It won't be extraordinary to, to see that because, you know, lately they've been uh, exploiting a lot of, uh, you know, traditional genres. They usually bring something new and uh, whether you know, on the consent side or just because, you know, the, of the exploitations. They also intend to do a lot of spin-offs and so to ex- definitely exploit the, the brand uh, further. They can do whatever they want and they, are, they don't have uh, the constraints that the, the traditional uh, players have. So for producers, it's definitely super interesting. We can expect them to, uh, to test a lot of ideas and to, uh, to try every time to make it bigger or diff- different. Then in terms of interactivity, they cannot exploit the same opportunities as, uh, you know, Facebook or doesn't mean that they want to try and find a way. <laughs> You know, it's interesting in its own right, isn't it? When we looked at, we were talking about formats and and what a format is, and it's something that gets remade in addressing key format points, but being made for different broadcasters in different cultures. And obviously, there's always a little bit of give and take, isn't there? There needs to be a bit of an adaptation if you're making a show for India, as you are if you're making it for the UK or you're making it for France, for example. This is a global talent singing show idea how do you possibly create a global show that's going to work in the majority of netflix's territories that's going to work culturally for everybody i guess uh, they'll just um you know be uh, very strategic and maybe uh, launch a few uh, territories first and see what happens the way they they uh, are uh, Developing their content is definitely according to their audience. So they own, they know their audience very well. And so they, they can either just uh, uh, launch a, a specific format for specific territories if, you know, they think it might be tricky, or they can definitely also adapt. And they all know that uh, um, local content is super successful. So they all know the power of adapting content, even if they are, have the power to, to launch it globally. Sometimes it's better also to launch a, a local uh, adaptation. So they'll definitely they'll be uh, pragmatic, as always. <laughs> Jesse, what's your story of the week? My story of the week is is around the BBC and the incoming uh, director general, Tim Davey, who has taken over from Tony Hall in the top job in uh, UK broadcasting. He started this week. So in fact, he started today as we record. And I think by the time people listen to this, he will have given his first sort of internal 
uh, team address to the entire BBC. Uh, he started in Glasgow today. He was up there meeting staff, uh, apparently. And he's just he's joined in a really tricky uh, period for the BBC. I mean, I d- I'm not entirely sure if there is ever a period that isn't particularly tricky for the BBC. <laughs> um, but it but it really does feel like he sort of walked into the eye of a storm here. Effectively, the BBC are being hit by several different things uh, that are happening at once. One of his key issues that he has to address immediately is sort of this this issue of bias, which uh, is plaguing the BBC at the moment. So the you know uh, uh, commentators on the left and commentators on the right feel that the BBC is um, catering for the other side too much. And I mean, you might argue that that's the BBC doing its job. That's healthy, surely, isn't it? You know, if, uh, if everyone's happy, then... You would think so. But apparently, Davey has uh, talked about the need to what he's described as serve all audiences. And he's been very clear about this. So I think he must feel that there is somewhere down the line, there is something that's not quite right. The language he's using is quite similar to the language that Oliver Dowden, the culture secretary, has used in the past, which has got some people on on one side of the the debate a little bit concerned that the BBC will start to become more compliant with with government um, and and sort of do become you know sort of less confrontational and, and experiment less and and uh, investigate less. I'm not sure that's necessarily going to happen, but it's I can understand why people are concerned by it. Um, he's doing things like reviewing Twitter use. Uh, we've got a really interesting piece on our website, which one of my colleagues wrote today, uh, sort of just outlining all of these various things that he, that Tim Davey will be addressing early on. So there's lots of questions around the impartiality of the journalists, and that's on both sides. There is a lot of convers- uh, questions around the way that uh, presenters uh, sort of conduct themselves in terms of other companies they work for. So he's got all of that to deal with. And then he's also got to look at the the content. And one of the stories that's kind of come out over the weekend, it was published in the Daily Telegraph, which for listeners outside of the UK, uh, that, that to give it some context, that's a sort of a newspaper from the uh, broadly and staunchly from the, uh, from the right wing. They put out a story saying that Davey was planning to specifically overhaul the comedy output, uh, which for years and years has been considered to be sort of politically to the left. Uh, so through shows like The Mash Report, through um, uh, Nish Kumar is a, a, a comedian and a presenter who sort of always gets thrown into the centre of these, uh, these, these debates. The insiders that we uh, have heard from are very clear that that isn't the case, that he's not going to be overhauling comedy. The fact that that story is even out there suggests there is something going on. And that's that's a concern. I don't know, from a personal point of view, I think, you know, right wing comedy is really hard to do. Right. But and that's why there aren't, there aren't very many right wing comedians out there. And I, I saw a, a tweet today, which someone saying that the reason why there's more left wing <laughs> comedy than right wing comedy on TV is the market forces have just find left wing comedy funnier, right? And the market dictates what goes on TV ultimately. So, even for a public service broadcaster with a license fee like the BBC, they have to follow the market. So, I mean, that's but that's my take on it, right? That doesn't that doesn't necessarily impact on on uh, on how anyone thinks. Broadly, I could probably say this to you any time uh, I was to come on here. Tim Davey it faces some really serious challenges to ensure the BBC is sort of ship shape for the future. Um, with you guys have obviously just been talking about Netflix and its push into unscripted. The BBC is really desperately trying to go after those sort of same audiences, those sort of 16 to 34 audiences that those shows, uh, those big formats and entertainment shows attract. It needs to do that because it's got a license fee which uh, is being debated all the time. And really the only way that you can justify that is by serving all audiences all the time. And we have done numerous stories at Broadcast which show the BBC is uh, is shedding 16 to 34s at a rate that at the moment it doesn't seem like it can stop. There's been various answers to that question bandied around. Um, last week at the Edinburgh TV Festival digital uh, event, Fiona Campbell, who's the BBC Three controller, 
uh, was quizzed on a story that broke a few months back about BBC Three, which was turned online in 2015, potentially turning back into a linear channel and was sort of quizzed quite thoroughly on the rationale behind that. So what, why are you putting a linear channel for 16 to 34s out there when clearly most 16 to 34s are watching Netflix and on demand? I don't know. I think you probably have to watch that session to get the kind of nuanced answer that Fiona Campbell gave. It's a murky one and it's a difficult thing for the BBC. There's a lot there. There's a lot for Tim Davey to, to get his uh, teeth into. I mean, surely the biggest one is the license fee, isn't it? And, you know, making people pay for iPlayer, because that is, it seems to be a crazy anachronism right now. Yeah, I mean, look, the BBC is is wrestling with all these different ways of potentially, you know, funding itself in the future. There was a story being bandied around that uh, Tony Hall, Tim Davies' predecessor, was looking at a sort of Swedish style system which is which is very different to the uk funding system look iplayer at the moment is free right that content is is on is on the iplayer after shows go on the um the bbc's linear channels and there's also acquisitions and stuff that they commission directly for the iplayer and the paid for stuff at the moment is is on um BritBox, right, which is a service that the BBC runs with ITV. Should be said, ITV is like by far and away the majority owner of, of that and it seems to be, from what we understand, the kind of real driving force behind it. Making people pay for something that they've already paid for is, is a really hard sell, isn't it? So, yeah. Well, it is. Yeah, it is. But I mean, I guess if you're British, and I, I guess everybody's had that same frustration when you go away on holiday or yeah. you go away for business and you you're a license fee payer and you you want to watch uh i play you want to catch up on on those uh amazing dramas or, or whatever content from bbc and you're in the states and you can't access it that has to be solved that sort of thing has got to be fairly at the top of a very long list yeah i mean you know the, the bbc has tried numerous times over the years to export its content in various different ways uh, it did run a global i player for a, a few years um cancelled that and, and stopped funding that a few years back. BBC Studios is probably the biggest distributor in the world outside of the US studios. So you get BBC content delivered that way. There's this very strange story going around at the moment about um, BBC4, which is a kind of older skewed arts channel primarily turned into some sort of streaming service internationally. You know, it looks like there'll be movement on this front, but like as of right now, we're sort of, you know, it's just one of many things on Tim Davies' to-do list to, to work out what the, the right way to go is. Coming on the back of an amazing job that they did as a public service broadcaster to help educate the uh, public and our kids as well over the uh, over the last few months as well, which has been extraordinary use of resources that only a public service broadcaster could do so that you know i think they really showed the value to certainly a uk audience if there was ever a debate as to why the bbc exists and to what the bbc can do lockdown has really proved like how extraordinarily good the bbc is at responding to challenges and like you say providing uh, information entertainment all of that stuff when it's most needed and you know there is no one who could objectively look at what the bbc did in lockdown and say that they were they weren't worth the license fee during that period even if you don't agree with the license fee sort of you know philosophically there's um 100% the bbc were they were excellent during lockdown it's that time in the show where every week our guests get to nominate their hero of the week and who or what they want to get in the bin jesse who's your hero of the week well i'm going to go for david olashoga uh who delivered the uh, mctaggart lecture uh at uh, the Edinburgh TV Festival last week. It's an obvious choice, but you know what? Sometimes the obvious choice is the right choice. So David, who is a historian and a presenter, who has a has, doesn't have a come from a sort of traditional white uh, middle class TV background, as it were, gave an extraordinary, amazing speech about the ways that the British TV industry has sort of failed in its uh, in its quest to become more diverse and talked through some of the ways that it could improve in the future i just thought that it was a really brave thing to do to stand up and basically say the people who are my paymasters 
aren't doing a good enough job. I mean, he even acknowledged it up at the top of his speech. He said, you know, if I get any work at the end of this, then uh, then I've done well. All, I would say almost across the board, there was unanimous praise uh, for for David's speech. I think I thought he was uh, he, he was really fantastic. Posed the questions that needed to be posed. I'm skeptical about the things that have been lip service has been paid to in the past and uh, and is potentially being paid to now. Um, and it just felt like it hit the right balance. It was. Uh, and it feels like one of those moments that will be remembered in the same way that Michaela Coles and McTaggart from, from 2018 uh, still resonates in the industry. I think this will be one that people go back to, you know, year after year as sort of where were you when David said that? I mean, the, the answer to that for 99% of the people um, watching it was sat in front of a computer. It was a really, really brilliant speech. That certainly had that cut through, I think, that uh, that he, he must have been looking for and roundly praised by the industry as a whole so uh okay so uh, david's your hero of the week natalie who's your hero of the week so uh before i give you a name i just wanted to say that we i mean it's not uh, not only playing with words but uh it we should uh definitely be our own heroes uh, because we have to uh, in this uh, troubled times we have to be to reinvent ourselves and i'm not only talking about covid uh, i'm talking about the digital uh, wave and uh, everyone is definitely has definitely to to, to try and, and reinvent uh, themselves. Uh, and I guess I, I not I guess I, I'm sure that in, you know the international market and uh, uh, is definitely a solution, and not only for big players but also for you know the, the, an independent producer. Um, that's uh, the way to be bold nowadays. And uh, so, and so, my my hero, maybe not of the week, but of the last uh, few months, uh, would be uh, Stéphane Courby, and uh, not only because he's French, <laughs> yeah. but um, is um, it definitely. I mean, what he did is was really bold. His story actually is really, really uh, extraordinary. It's uh, it started as an intern in an independent uh, production company in France, and uh, to, when you look at uh, everything is he achieved, and now he's uh, running. Uh, a very strong uh, uh, group, even if it means that in the next few months uh, they'll have to solve uh, uh, really big problems also. Uh, I mean, usual problems uh, for uh, mergers uh, for such uh, big groups, uh, but definitely it, it opens uh, for him really big opportunities. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, for me, it's definitely the, the hero of the week. All right. Jesse, who or what are you telling to get in the bin? I, I was sort of racking my brain and the thing that has been annoying me the most, and it's probably been annoying me for about two years. Okay. Oh, this is going to be a good one. This is the, you, you, you've been waiting to scratch this itch. I have actually. And, and uh, there were a few stories that came out this week, which sort of annoyed me and potentially calmed me slightly, but what it is, it's, it's the walking dead, right? Which is a show that I absolutely love. Uh, I've followed it since the first series. I'm one of those folk who didn't give up when uh, around season seven, when the, the sort of crazy ratings that it used to get um, went down to sort of normal, regular TV uh, sphere ratings. But basically, without spoiling the entire series, the main character, uh, played by Andrew Lincoln, Rick Grimes, uh, left the show in series nine. But, but wasn't wasn't killed off, uh, and that's not a spoiler to say, and uh, was announced very quickly afterwards as uh, that Andrew Lincoln would star in three Walking Dead movies, uh, sort of telling his story post uh, the TV series, which I thought was a really good idea, quite a nice way to potentially to wrap up the, the entire thing. That was announced ages ago, and whilst I'm not saying it's simple to write a film script, there's basically been absolutely no proper information since you get the odd piece in the US trades around where an exec producer will say something like, oh, I've seen a script and it looks good, but effectively nothing's happened. Right. And um, the show has been losing steam for quite a long time. There are very spin-off shows which are you know, uh, successful to different degrees. And there's, in fact, they're about to launch a sort of youth, uh, like a, a young adult uh, walking dead, which I cannot, 
quite work out how that's going to work. It, it's just it, the two sort of concepts of like you know zombie horror and and young folk. Uh, it doesn't doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. Um, maybe it'll be good. Basically, everyone wants to know what's going on with with the Rick Grimes character, and no one is saying anything. And I'm getting really bored of it. And uh, I just think they need to hurry up and uh, either either cancel it or do it. There you go. That's a that's that's my gripe. <laughs> It's extraordinary, really, if you think about they have a globally renowned franchise, you know, which has taken years to build up. And you would think a few movies to add to that sort of cinematic universe, if you like, would be a sort of slam dunk. So if anybody's listening and knows any information whatsoever about these Rick Grimes movies, let us know. You know what it's like, Justin? It's like... um uh, I mean, I, I don't read the the Game of Thrones novels, right? But I know that the most, uh, you, you know, that there's one that that um, George Martin has been writing for about 25 years, and never gets around to doing. And you know, the series like superseded the book, even though they thought that would never happen. It feels like we might be here in 25 years, and I'll still be saying, "Where's the Rick Grimes movie?" Right. Well, if we are still here in 25 years, you can be sure there will be an invitation to come back on. And we'll talk about it again. All right, I'll hold you to it. As as old men, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and expressing our displeasure when the new format, whatever format that we're watching our movies on, or holographic formats. Let's see if there's there's anything in in twenty five years. Natalie, who or what are you chucking in the bin? I, I would. Uh, uh... Uh, choose fear and for myself also I mean it's fear is definitely something uh, I try to fight uh, uh, not every day but really uh, <laughs> very often and I think that's also what uh, I mean makes uh, us all uh, make mistakes whether you know big players or again in, really independent uh, uh, producers uh, you know everyone is trying uh, because of fear to uh, to play with the the same recipes, like, uh, you know, do uh, reboots or spin-offs or rip-offs, etc. Ultimately, I think, the, you know, the, our clients are the viewers. They are always grateful to, you know, the, the, the players who try, really try to, to please them with new ideas. Even if they don't watch it or if they, even if it's not a, a big success, they'll be grateful to the platform or to the channel who's trying and trying. So that's definitely what's happening with, uh, with the, the streamers. But uh, I remember also uh, NBC a few years ago um, tried a, a game show. I don't remember the title, but it was the Stephen Lambert game show. And it, it, it didn't uh, do really well. But I remember uh, articles about NBC trying and uh, that we should support the channel because of that. Uh, I think that's uh, definitely fear, again, is something we should uh, <laughs> put in the bin uh, every, every single day. Quite right. And bravery is and creativity is something that really keeps the TV industry going. Yeah. And uh, that's what makes us uh, passionate about our, our job. I mean, we should never forget why we chose to to work in this industry. And it was uh, passion, about passion. I mean, for a lot of people, it's passion. And we should, uh, you know, always yeah. keep that in mind. Just, uh, you know, stick to the content, be passionate about the content. And usually if you are passionate about the content, there's something behind and uh, we should fight for our convictions. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's a brilliant note to end on. Natalie, thank you so much for joining us from L.A. Great to have you on the show. Jesse, from slightly closer to home in London, great to hear about developments in broadcast. Really look forward to seeing the uh, the new magazine when it drops later on in September. And thank you both for coming on Telecast. Yeah, thank you very much. Cheers, Justin, anytime. So it's that time of the show where we get to go over to Hollywood and speak to Deadline Hollywood's Peter White. Peter, how are you? I'm good, Justin. How are you doing? Very good. Yeah, yeah. We're uh, we're in September now. This is uh, extraordinary. Back to work for everybody. So it's interesting time of the year after all of this pandemic. I, I can't believe I've been here for six months. It feels like I just stepped off the plane. Yeah. Your experience there has uh, sort of mirrored this whole lockdown scenario. So it's kind of living history of coronavirus from, uh, from TV land itself. Um, Certainly one way to make an entrance. 
what new stories have you got for us this week? It's been uh, it's been a bit of a strange week. You, August usually is a bit quiet um, in TV terms, but but that hasn't really been the case. Um, certainly for us over here, you know, colleagues of mine breaking breaking TV stories with you know the likes of Arnold Schwarzenegger and Nick Cage doing their their first TV series. But um, but I figured the, the, the biggest story, or certainly the biggest project of the week, is has come from uh, the Game of Thrones creators, David Benioff and DB Weiss. They did that, if you remember, a big Netflix overall deal last year. It was about last August that they actually finally signed it. They were been courted for quite some time um, and they've got this sort of big first world building show to come out of that it's a, they're adapting a sci-fi book trilogy called the three body problem a chinese sci-fi drama tells of uh, humanity's first contact with aliens um it, you know you'd think having their names attached would be enough but but listen to this is a list of uh, executive producer credits you've got uh, Alexander Wu, who is the co-creator of uh, AMC's The Terror, Infamy. He's going to help write and exec produce it. You've got Rian Johnson, the director of Star Wars, The Last Jedi, and, and Knives Out. You have Rosamund Pike involved. You've got Plan B, which is Brad Pitt's uh, production company. Um, so, yeah, this is their big, uh, their big swing. Um, I, I guess you can sort of see why Netflix uh, paid them uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. Absolutely. And there's some big names there. I mean, obviously, some of them are involved on a talent basis, but perhaps others are just involved on an investment basis, do we think? You know what, they haven't really split it out, and we've asked the question. They're not actually talent either. It, it's, it feels like they've got a lot of exec producer credits, and, and I wonder whether that's to do with, you know, who's involved uh, sort of rights-wise. I genuinely don't know, but I think Hollywood's certainly going this way. Uh, I mean, I wrote a, a story about a, a dance format that had LL Cool J and Chris O'Donnell attached this morning, and there was no particular reason. I think that's, you know, the thing that, that talent can help sell projects. So I wonder, not that these guys needed any help uh, selling it, but uh, it's nice to nice to be involved, I guess. You, you often see some sort of um, odd exec producer credits on, on big dramas. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. It's, uh, you know, I, I guess for, for them it's a, a case of let's see what they come up with. Uh, it's a big world. It's a similarly big world to Game of Thrones, and I think there'll be a lot of pressure. But uh, that's sort of why Netflix done it. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, to go for a, a Chinese literary universe if you like that they're bringing into into this as a is a project i guess it must be an incredibly rich book and uh, a rich storytelling can you tell us any more about it yeah the cynic in me uh, sort of suggests that this is one way to finally get netflix into china hmm. but having done a little bit of research i haven't actually read the books but they have been incredibly popular here in the states and President Obama was a, a big fan. So I think um, it's not quite as cynical as perhaps uh, I thought. But yes, big world. How does, you know, there's certain people, the sort of synopsis, uh, certainly from the first book, is some people want the aliens to come here and, and help take over, and others don't. Um, I think you'll see it similarly to, to Game of Thrones, there's going to be lots of different um, worlds within this world. So um, they're going to spend a lot of money on it. And any idea when they're going to go into production? I mean, it's a million dollar question, or, the, or the probably much more than a million dollar question, but any idea when, when they might go into production on this? No, absolutely not. I have a feeling this is one of those things that might take many years. But you know, regardless of the, the production shutdown, I don't think this was planning to shoot anytime soon. Yeah. And uh, and uh, what else have you got for us? The, um, the craziest story I've written or, or read in a while um, is about this actress called Marisol Nichols. Um, she's a relatively sort of BC list actress. Um, she's in the CW's Riverdale. Um, she's got a spot in, uh, in the new Saw reboot. But um, over the last six years, she's been an undercover sex trafficking agent. So she's been working with the FBI... Um, and a non-profit group called Operation Underground Railroad uh, to serve as bait for sting operations. And, and she's done this in a couple of ways. She's either sort of played the part of a, a parent pimping out a child or, depending on, on the sort of situation, using her acting skills to, to pretend to be a child being pimped out. And it's a fascinating story. It was actually, uh, she did a big piece or big interview with uh, Mary Claire back uh, earlier this year and and the sort of hook for, for us is that she's turning this into a into a TV series. Sony Pictures Television has just optioned the rights to, to this story. 
but it's it's absolutely sort of gone wild on our site. Um, you know, people sort of can't believe that someone who's sort of been been you know working in network television and and feature films had the had the sort of time or, or inclination to to do this. Um, I, I certainly can't think of a another actor who's had such an odd side hustle. If you talk about art imitating life by somebody who's an actress as well, it's quite it's quite an extraordinary story. This is a Sony show that's uh, that's going to come together. Yeah, they're just in, in the early stages of development. She's going to exec produce it, and she might star in it, depending. Um, uh, given given how much sort of ink or, or, or links as you like it, it's got this week. I, I, I can imagine this sort of being being picked up somewhere. Um, you know, whether that's a streamer or a broadcast network, I don't know. But you could you could see it either way. Fascinating story. I would I would say to people go read the the Mary Claire piece because you can't do justice for for this without sort of it's a it's a sort of long form long form read. But it's just those sort of fascinating fascinating stories. The sort of oddness of of television. And you know, my colleague Jake Cantor had uh, had a similar piece a couple of weeks ago about a, a TV producer who'd gone gone missing. And I, I just sort of wonder that where is there more of this is. Is there sort of these stories beneath the stories that, that we and, and others can sort of dig out? Because, yeah, you know, truth is often stranger than fiction, and we're certainly seeing that with this. Well, absolutely. And, and I have to say, Peter, some of the stories that uh, that we've been discussing over the last uh, few weeks, which is, you know, is we, may, we maybe need a sort of a, a bit of a klaxon, which is an only in Hollywood type story, right? Because this is, this is no, could happen nowhere else. I mean, look, Tinsel Town's a crazy town, and there's some strange shit going on here. Let's just see uh, see what's next, Justin. Well, we'll be relying on you to dig those stories out for us for next week's show. Peter, thank you again. I'll post all those links up on the episode description so everybody can go and have a look at this uh, this incredible story. So make of it what you will. All the best. Lovely. Thanks, Justin. So once again, it's that time in the show where we get to go over to Riga and speak to Gertz Leases from K7 Media. Gertz, how are you? Hi, Justin. Very well, thank you. How about you? Did you miss me? <laughs> of course. We all missed you. Absolutely. It's, gr- it's great to have you back. It's September. Exactly. You know, it's it's back to business. It's, it's all about back to work. Business is going to come flowing back. Yeah. And it's going to be just like it was a year ago. It almost looks like that. <laughs> you know, we see the cases of uh, virus rising again, even in the countries which seemed like safe havens back in July, including some e- central European markets, which were, you know, preparing to reopen for international productions even, and as well as countries as distant as Australia and New Zealand. However, on the upside, I think you're right. We are seeing a fantastic resilience and creativity. And I mean, not just creative creativity, but production, producing creativity, being business smart with various success, obviously, but seems like most countries are adapting to the current situation. You know, at K7, we are producing a regular, uh, what we are calling a quarantine TV report for our clients. And last week, when I was asking our colleagues in Poland, for instance, about what the TV schedules were looking like in their country and how much different they are from a normal fall, which, as we all know, is the peak season in most markets. I got an assuring answer that the production had resumed with precaution measures introduced everywhere, of course. The main channels were set for a regular autumn. And indeed, in Poland, we see big shows like Love Island, Ninja Warrior and The Voice, uh, to name just a few, either in production or already launching. And since I've started um, now talking about um, Central Eastern European situation, then it's pretty much the same in other countries of that region as well. Big shows like uh, Your Face Sounds Familiar, MasterChef, Dancing with the Stars, at least three more countries premiering The Masked Singer as well. Of course, I realize that not all markets are so lucky. Australians, for instance, have been forced to stop the production of The Mass Singer just before recording the finale, putting the entire cast and crew of the, this popular show into isolation after several members reportedly being tested positive. But I think that sometimes the measures taken to guarantee success of the recordings and well-being of participants and crew can be as demanding as doing the show itself, you know. Like, um, for instance, in UK, as you probably know already, 120 members of Great British Bake Off production uh, lived in a self-contained biosphere for six weeks during the shoot to avoid having to 
socially distance. And in the US, all Big Brother contestants were requested yeah. to spend two months in isolation, even prior to entering the house. But one thing is for sure, though, uh, even in countries where the epidemiological situation is slightly better, the list of returning seasons of well-known formats is much, much longer than new launches. And we are also increasingly seeing shows which used to bring their participants and crews to exotic destinations, moving production back to their home territory. As you may recall, I already in earlier editions uh, reported about the Finnish version of Love Island, which was set up in Finland's territorial waters this time. And this pattern is now followed uh, by by a few other shows, like uh, in UK, production of uh, I'm a Celebrity moving into a ruined castle in North Wales instead of Australian jungle, while the US version of Love Island has changed its production set from the tropical Fiji villa to Las Vegas. And ITV Studio Sweden is currently producing locally a Corona special of long-running sports reality competition Superstars, which is usually filmed in Cyprus. And a similar approach is taken in Sweden by various other shows normally recorded abroad, including Survivor, Eternal Glory, and X on the Beach. So the question is, with all of these shows swapping out these exotic sun trap locations for more local locations every day. Could this set a new precedent for reality television? It's probably too early to come to such conclusions, but if viewership doesn't significantly drop, this might spell a new era of local production. While costs may be similar due to the increased expense of production in the current environment, the benefits of not having to ship endless cast and crew abroad is surely to be a growing factor for production companies and broadcasters alike. And whether they alter the atmosphere will still provide that much needed slice of escapism remains to be seen. But with a number of locally made series on the horizon, we don't have too long a wait to find out, I think. Personally, I think that going forward, it's going to be a healthy mix of both. And certainly after watching a lot of their Nordic noir like forests and lakes, the same Swedes will be looking forward to get back to those paradise islands again. But of course, there will be shows that will prove working equally well in different environments. Obviously, what we are seeing, particularly during uh, summer, was that the current travel limitations had surged the audience's thirst for programming involving travel. Such shows also cater for the broader trend of escapism, which doesn't necessarily mean that viewers need to be virtually transported to an inland paradise. Uh, such ex- escapism can range from uh, like total immersing into beauty of nature to accepting that reality could be actually worse than where I am in now, sitting and watching this from my couch. And one way to show different bits and pieces of the world, but still avoiding crossing multiple borders, could be, for instance, sending separate teams to explore different countries or even form new co-production partnerships with local companies. In such a way, a show can provide that good old feel that uh, the whole world is still travelable. And we see such examples emerging recently. For instance, uh, Discovery Channel in Poland just launched a show which uh, follows three different teams who uh, left their po- previous lives to travel the world in a recreational vehicle. And the episodes have been filmed in so different places like Spain, Georgia and Australia as well. So can you see any other non-scripted trends particularly standing out? I've probably told it before, but it's maybe the feel-good, good vibe shows in general, entertainment with purpose, assuring shows that are trying to boost some confidence that we are all in this together and things are going to get better again. For instance, there is a variety of shows in different countries where businessmen, uh, entrepreneurs, those who have money are finding ways to help those individuals or communities which uh, haven't been so lucky at these times. Or even, you know, famous long-running business formats are adapting that uh, quite different note in some territories, like the Dragon's Den, for instance. Togetherness as an allegory is also at the heart of the bridge. Originally, a Spanish format, El Puente, a reality series currently in production in the UK, in which 12 strangers are brought together on the edge of a lake in the British countryside and given 20 days to build a bridge to the prize spot, which lies at the center of the lake. And uh, if they are successful, the group must vote for who they think is uh, most deserving of the prize. 
And then the winner must uh, decide whether to keep the money or share it with their team. Similarly, in Australia, uh, the locally very popular home renovation show, The Block, has applied a new twist this season, a new purpose, we can say, with participating couples renovating rundown period homes from uh, the first half of the 20th century and turning them into luxurious uh, living spaces. In Belgium, they just launched a daily quiz show, which is even called The Positives. Each half hour episode sees three celebrity panelists go in search of the best news of the day, setting aside the doom and gloom that so often dominates headlines. Well, that's interesting. Belgium again. We, we, we again. touched on uh, some yeah, Belgian shows quite a few uh, weeks ago, and uh, we, we're touching again here on uh, on Belgium. I think that we should probably look to do a, a Belgium special at some point soon you know really to understand what's actually going yes, going I on agree. over there. there's a lot of creativity happening but um and you regularly bring to my attention Gertz, some of these yeah. formatted ideas which you know we wouldn't imagine even existed mm. um anything to share you know you've <laughs> given me the 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 the, uh, the starter the main course what about dessert <laughs> well i think this time it's probably got to be a production from Czech Republic and it's a reality show that sees 16 entrepreneurs participating in various competitions just guess in the field of marijuana growing the winner is going to receive a million dollar cash prize and a chance to cooperate with a man called Michael Straumietis the show's trailblazer and a world's tycoon of the hemp fertilizer industry the format is called The Next Marijuana Millionaire. And so you don't think it's just some kind of a joke. This show is actually airing on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, Pluto TV, and other streaming services. Wow. Wow. Well, it's yes. it's high time somebody made a show. <laughs> it's high time. It's high season. It's yeah, high time. Yeah, it's high, yeah. high TV high season. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Well, you've got to say California. They're going to be, the, you know, that's going to be a, uh, 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 you know, a, a prime market for uh, for this type of show um last time i was over in california i mean i just you know the 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 smell was everywhere of uh, of mm. grass and uh, it's you know it's obviously you know really key part of society over there now but um interesting can we see the next marijuana millionaire being uh, being the big new international format i wonder maybe mm. maybe let's let's uh, let's see mm. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll speak to you soon. Speak soon. Well, we've reached the end of another week's show. Thanks as always for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Please do rate and subscribe to the show and share it with friends and colleagues on social media. If you want to hear about our advertising and sponsorship packages, please email me on justin at boomdialogue.com. That's justin at boomdialogue.com. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers. We'll see you again next week. Till then, stay safe.